Our next presentation is going to be by uh, Brian Monacelli with uh, support from Marco Lavita as well uh, about how we align this instrument and what the results of that alignment were in and TNT. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, interest in this. Um, I recently gave a talk at SBIE Optics and Photonics just last week on this, uh, and I covered uh, about 80 slides in uh, half an hour for an invited talk. So if you want to see the details on this, you can refer to that SBIE briefing. It was uh, very efficient. So I, I'm Brian Monicelli. I led the optical alignment of the chronograph instrument, and uh, I compiled these, uh, this information with Mark Malavita, but also um, the optomechanical team that supported me. It was a significant part of this effort. Um, when we aligned the chronograph instrument, we did so in reverse sequence. So you saw the sequence by which the light goes through the chronograph instrument from uh, Gary's talk. And so for the optical alignment, I'm just going to talk through quickly how we put the harbor on the bench. And we did so in the reverse order from small beam space, uh, starting at uh, the exit people eight, uh, which is located right down here, um, all the way through to the uh, FSM that projects or receives the light from the chronograph or from the Roman Space Telescope. So this sequence of slides will show how the uh, hardware populated the bench. First of all, we started uh, with a measurement of all the fiducials on the bench and we located it in a ferrometer relative to all of those fiducials. So around the bench, we had 10 different SMR fiducials, uh, one shown here, uh, one down here, for instance, and we placed the interferometer in 3D space using an SMR um, at the pupil plane of XP8. And that SMR was registered to a target pixel on the interferometer camera, which then served as our boresight reference for the subsequent alignment. Then we uh, added each element in sequence. So the first element was the last of X paraboloidal mirror, OAP8. Any focusing OAP, which uh, in reverse order will be the uh, even numbered OAPs, we uh, sought to receive a focused interferogram using a pupil re-imager rather than just a mirror at the reference so that we're able to re-image the pupil and get a high quality interferogram. And when we aligned the uh, off-axis parabolital mirrors, we did so using more rods. So here you see the more rod to control elevation, to control azimuth angle of those OEPs. So those were the angular adjustments. And then the lateral placement was controlled using eccentric bushings that were machined into the bench. So these bushings were actually uh, part of the mount, and then they had mounts machined into the OVSA optical bench. So we were able to control lateral position in a horizontal sense, and then also focus, and we were able to adjust the height using physical shims of these. So we were able to control uh, five degrees of freedom um, in that way, and actually a six degree of freedom was clocking, uh, which we did use here, and you could see kind of the ends of the morad so we could clock the OEP if necessary. Didn't prove to be a significant contributor in the alignment process because we did well before putting these OAPs into their mounds under interferometric inspection. We were able to probe their optical points, such as their uh, focal points and the vectors coming out of the OAPs for collimated light with respect to the fiducials on their mount. So all of these mounts had uh, fiducials that were placed in a point cloud delivered to the Roman Space Telescope team. Um, after OAP 8, we put an OAP 7, uh, odd-ordered OAPs at collimating. So we have a uh, mirror at the uh, pupil plane of OAP 7, uh, after OAP 7, which is the Leo stop plane. And then OAP 6 came in. Uh, we then had a surrogate uh, focal plane mask uh, in for that. And we couldn't put the focal plane mask right at its focus, so we had it slightly off. For the initial alignment, we moved it later. OEP5 then used a surrogate flat to return the beam at the uh, spam location. And then OEP4. OEP3 was added with the static fold mirror. That static fold mirror uh, brought the long focal length of OEP3 back onto the bench to uh, keep everything tight on this grand piano size optical bench. Uh, DM2 had a surrogate mirror in place uh, for this particular alignment. And then uh, DM1 uh, was added along with a uh, reference corner cube at OAP2 so that we could place the beam properly on the whole of OAP2. So that corner cube was aligned to that target boresight pixel of the interferometer. Um, and then the mirrors, the circuit mirrors were tilted to get the proper angle. Um, OAP2 was then added with the pupil re-imager, the focus control mirror, um, then added a surrogate flat uh, for the focus control mirror 
and the light was reflected back through the hole in OAP2 to OAP1, and then a uh, reference flat was included at the FSM, the, folk, uh, the fine steering mirrors plane. All of this alignment was done uh, with the beam path as it is off of the CGI bench. It was about 50 millimeters in elevation. You'll notice here that all of this uh, includes the static optics. So none of these include any active mechanisms. The surrogate flat mirrors were uh, precision uh, mirrors that were used uh, in place of the active optical elements because those were still being developed at that time. We were able to achieve end-to-end uh, -end wave front error at this point. Uh, this slide shows the animation to put the uh, FPAM to the right plane, and we're able to include the lobe optics at this uh, point using the uh, beam profiling camera. We then uh, started inserting the uh, active optical elements, starting with the easiest one, which was the focus control mirror. This one had more rods as well to tip and tilt the beam back onto the uh, bore site of the interferometry. I will note uh, something I omitted from the slides here is that after static optics alignment, we had an end-to-end -end wave front error measurement of about 16 nanometers relative to a 40 uh, nanometer RMS requirement. Um, now we add in the uh, active optics, focus control mirror comes next, then the SPAM uh, was inserted, the focal plane uh, mask alignment mechanism, and then the Leo stop, you'll notice the interferometer is still in place on the bench, so we can't add the final three. Those are in the same location as the uh, final three uh, PAMs. So we added DM2 and then DM1. Those, as Gary mentioned, um, in their uh, ambient state contributed a significant amount of wavefront. So we then went through a process of uh, realigning the off-axis paraboloidal mirrors to accommodate some of the uh, native deformable mirror aberration. And in doing so, we were able to require, uh, recover margin on the stroke of the focus control mirror and the DM actuators. So the OEP mirrors were realigned to accommodate the native aberrations of the DMs. Um, and then we uh, used a, or a, a laser tracker-based technique to align the uh, uh, FSM, and the FSM was placed uh, along with an alignment telescope that projected a beam into CGI. This alignment telescope was used as our source by which we measured the bore site after subsequent environmental testing of the chronograph instrument. And that was done uh, throughout all the environmental test campaigns before and after every environmental test. We then uh, removed the interferometer, and actually I'll go back to that for a second. This was an interesting configuration because we were able to project the beam from the alignment scope onto the target pixel of the interferometer and vice versa, the interferometer back to the alignment scope to show that we had good foresight uh, alignment when the FSM was aligned. Then we removed the interferometer and we integrated the field stop uh, alignment mechanism, the color filters, and the dispersion and polarization optics. Then we worked with uh, Nathan Bush and Patrick Morrissey and the CGI camera team to integrate and align the low cam. Uh, Brian Kern uh, came up with a great technique by which an occulter was scanned in order to place the low cam, uh, sorry, the lobe optics accurately, and then place the image on the corner of the uh, low cam focal plane so that we were able to reduce latency in a small 50 by 50 region uh, image, which I think Nathan will talk about later and then we were able to integrate the exit camera. So this completed the alignment end to end of all the uh, CGI optics. Um, and even though I said it quickly here, it took a, uh, almost a year to do so. <laughs> all right. um, as I said, the end to end wavefront error after the static optics were introduced was uh, 16 uh, nanometers uh, against a uh, 30 nanometer, or, sorry, a 40 nanometer requirement. And I mentioned that the CGI DMs required adjustment when we originally went in to install the DMs, we had four alignment goals. One was to replace the surrogates. Next was to align their actuator grids laterally into that coordinate system that we'd created with the laser tracker point cloud. And then we wanted to check the pupil alignment and then ensure that the actuators of DM1 were nested within the actuators of DM2. That's all we thought we had to do. So simple alignment tasks upcoming. Um, we uh, were able to do the first step with the laser tra uh, tracker that was fairly simple. Um, and we noticed this was the first wavefront that we measured of the DM, significantly higher than the 16 nanometers RMS we saw earlier. Um, we then recognized that during uh, previous testing, they did have a dry out that was necessary. So we dried them out for some time. 
brought the wafer and error down. Uh, sorry, I don't have that slide to about 128 uh, nanometers. And so we recognize that this fifth objective was necessary, which was to accommodate the alignment with other optics. Um, so before we were able to do that, we wanted to register the DM. So we poke DM1 in this cross manner. We poke DM2 in this L-shaped manner. And then we're able to dif take different interferograms to see that the uh, actuators were indeed registered within the 100 micrometer requirement. And uh, we're able to achieve about 11 microns horizontally and 46 vertically. Vertical was a little bit harder because we had to physically remove the DM and replace physical shims in order to do this. So it was a tedious process to achieve uh, vertical, but we were still able to do as well within requirement. Um, to compensate for the DM native aberrations, uh, due to the moisture we uh, and recover margin, we moved these OAP mirrors um, and accommodated the line of sight with the FCM and the uh, static fold mirrors as well. So not just one OAP mirror pair, but two were moved to essentially add back in aberration and accommodate the DM native aberrations. And then we brought the final uh, and then wave for an error down to 44 nanometers RMS. And I asked Gary what the uh, requirement was, and he said it's very complicated. So <laughs> I'll defer to Gary to, uh, to discuss that. And basically, it is complicated because we had a front end and a back end requirement, and this is an end to end measurement. So that's the deconvolution we have to do. And this is before any phase flattening of the DM was performed. Um, after every single test, we verified the pointing of the instrument. We went and we aligned that alignment scope to the Roman uh, input line of sight. So we set the Roman bore sight, and then we measured our bore sight reference, which no longer could be that pixel on the interferometer, but it was the occulter that we had aligned uh, with the precision line of mechanism. So we actually used an occulter, and we looked to see um, where that occulter fell in the aligned alignment uh, scope crosshair. And so you see here a representation of it. That's not the, the best picture. Uh, but it is a, a representation of how far off our target we were after every environmental test. And um, here's our requirement shown with the uh, gray circle. Here, uh, plus or minus half an arc second on sky. Um, before dynamics, we were here. After dynamics, we had a larger jump. But then after thermal vacuum testing, it settled in closer to our free dynamics numbers. We considered to be small, uh, these to be small changes, and all uh, values were met. And we did uh, then ship our point cloud to the Roman team and show that we complied with all of our interface requirements to Roman. We delivered to Goddard Space Set, uh, Flight Center and integrated it without significant uh, change uh, to the pointing. And uh, that concluded the alignment campaign. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. There was one online from Julie Van Kempen. Okay. Uh, I assume you were not able to test for out of field stray light entering the instrument. Were you able to model this? Yeah, that I'm was more from the last one. Oh, yeah, we, we can talk a little bit about stray light. We did two straight light uh, uh, tests. Actually, we, we did one off axis uh, set of measurements where we did measure off axis angles. So we did that interferometrically. We did look for off axis performance and confirm off axis performance. And then also after um, full integration at Goddard with all the MLI blank and stray light control in place, um, we ran a stray light test where we essentially ran the cameras in wide open video mode and shown a number of lights around all of the salient apertures of CGI where the blanket had any seam or anything like that. And we saw absolutely no signal on any of the cameras. So those were the two stray light checks that we did. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Thank you.